Welcome to Paper Napkin Wisdom, Genevieve Patero. Uh, now, I want to say your name is Genevieve because I'm Canadian and that's what we do. Uh, but uh, Genevieve, uh, really thrilled to have you here. You shared an interesting paper napkin and I'm going to read it. Uh, it's not the power of one that changes things. It's the power of one another that moves mountains and moves people. Why did you share that with me? Well, you know, for years before I even began my story, I hear, as we probably all do, look at the power of one whenever something magnificent happened or somebody did something new. The power of one is amazing. Look at that person. Look at this person. And people would say that when pajama program was starting to grow and it didn't feel right, but I couldn't put my finger on what irked me about that because the growth I knew was something that was, was not all mine. And one day someone said that to me, Oh, look at that power of one. Look what you did. And I turned and I, I said, no, it's not the power of one. It's the power of one another that moves mountains and moves people. And I remember that person was taken back and so was I. Because it's, that's the truth. That's the truth. Not much can happen with one great idea. Not much can happen with one great person, but it's sharing that vision and the vulnerability that comes with it that attracts support people who want to be part of growing that vision because they believe in it too. Um there's so much that you said there. First of all, let, let's let's go back and talk about Pajama Program, right? Because I think, I mean, so, so Pajama Program is a great program and certainly talk about that for a second. But I love this sort of like droplet that caused the idea to take momentum for you. Maybe Maybe you could talk about how the idea came about and what Pajama Program is just real briefly, because I have, I have, there's two questions that came out of that that are really interesting, but let, let's talk about that droplet, that droplet of purpose. Of course. Sure. I was climbing the corporate ladder because that's what I thought success was. That's what I always wanted to do from watching, you know, Mary Tyler Moore's Mary Richards character as a kid. She was a single woman in a big city in a man's world and in TV. And I wanted to be her. And that was a little contrary to my father off the book, off the book, my father off the boat from Italy and my mom also Italian there. They raised me to be a traditional Italian woman and get married and have kids. And Mary was my, my idol. So I was being married for 12 years in New York city. And one day in the quiet of my apartment, I heard a voice in me and I'm touching my, my heart, my chest. That's where it came from. I found out later, but it asked me if this is the next 30 years of your life, is this enough? And that stopped me cold. I said, you know, I'm going to be alone in 30 years if I don't figure out why that question went right to the core of who I am. And I felt a hole. And I realized that I would wanted children in my life in, in some way. And I went to visit children in shelters because of that longing to find those vulnerable children that I'd seen on the news a few days earlier who were being hurt by people who were supposed to be taking care of them. And I called and I, and I was invited in to read stories at night to them. And I was never more grounded. I just brought stories week after week and sat on the floor in my business suit and read to them. But what happened one day was what changed everything. When I followed them into the room they were going to go to sleep in bedtime, and I saw them hugging each other and trying to huddle onto a cot together or a futon or single bed and they were squirming in the clothes they'd been wearing for, I don't know how long you could, you know, I could tell they, they didn't fit well and they weren't clean. And I brought pajamas the next time. Just a simple thing. I didn't have any plan except to give them to the children for a little more comfort because I, I saw them lonely and hurt. And I remembered my mom and our pajama time was great. And when I started handing them out, one little girl was so afraid of me and she wouldn't take them. And I gently tried to hand them to her. She just backed off from me. The other kids took them quietly. It was always quiet. And she watched me. And I finally went over to her before I left, tried one more time. And I talked to her about how soft they were. And I showed her they were pink and that she had pink in her shirt. And she leaned in and she asked me, what are pajamas? And that's, that's when everything really fell apart in in my head, it, it was like fireworks went off and 
nothing mattered except I wanted to grab her and hold her and take her home. But I had to, I had to explain pajamas to this little girl and, and let her go into the room with the lovely people who took care of her and I had to leave. But I couldn't stop thinking about this simple, the simple pajamas and what, and what they meant. And it wasn't about the material. It was about the love and the loneliness I felt through her. Like she was channeling this loneliness and this sadness that just broke my heart. And I was afraid to tell anyone what I was doing because I knew my corporate days were waning. I knew what my heart and head were fighting about. And it was for months that I kept the secret and you know, tried to juggle both until I found the power of the human connection. I, I think I think there's a, a lot of interesting things there. And you, you talk um, now, this is the second sort of introduction to this idea that that this genesis of an idea, the momentum behind behind the pajama program all came from this vulnerability that allowed you to sort of express this doubt, this question, this, how, how hard was it for you to access that vulnerability? I mean, I, I think it, I think it becomes easier over time, but in that time, you know, you're, you're, you're Mary Tyler Moore wearing the, the iron suit going into, uh, into Manhattan and, and taking it prisoner, uh, climbing the ladder, as you said, but then something shifted in, in this vulnerable moment. Let's talk about that. Like, it, it, it did how did that come about? How did you how did you learn to trust that? Well, my emotions were really on the shelf through the corporate career I had. You know, we weren't we weren't very emotional back then. Certainly, if you were a woman, you know, you just you just had straight face, you did what you were told, you, you know, you met the goals and, and that was it. it. It was hard to really, to let your heart, wear your heart on your sleeve. But in that moment, everything just gushed out of me. It was like 12 years of holding everything in, in this Italian heart <laughs> that I had, you know, I had locked up in the corporate world, just rushed out of me. And that's why I think I was so confused and that's why I didn't know what to do. And that's why I didn't tell anyone what was happening or where I'd been for months because it was just still to this day when I speak, I cry often. And when I think about it, I can picture her right here and I can feel that connection heart to heart and how I feel her loneliness and her pain. Maybe that's because we all have that. You know, I think I thought a lot about it because it was so, um, heartbreaking for me and so difficult for me still to wrap my my arms around her question and and having to be so lonely and afraid and i just think it just gushed gushed out and it it hasn't stopped gushing <laughs> i love it uh, you know and i and i think it's so interesting right we i think we if we look at mary tyler moore as you know sort of an example of the time something you wanted to emulate Maybe Instagram and Facebook and TikTok has that place in people's hearts today. And it's the veneer. I mean, Mary Tyler Moore laughed and cried on the show all the time, but a professional woman wasn't allowed to do that. Right? Right. I mean, and and uh, that's, I mean, as, a, as a man thinking about it, it's, it's sort of, it's very interesting because I think about it in terms of today, right? I mean, I think it's a lesson today, right? When you were watching something on Instagram or if you're watching the veneer of what people put together on TikTok, uh, emulating that in real life isn't the same thing. And that's kind of what you're talking about, I think, with the emotion of it. But but the part that really is sticking with me is this question, like, what are pajamas, right, that, that this little girl asked you? And... I, I mean, as a leader, as a, as a, as a, you know, type A personality, you are climbing a ladder, you're, you know, a successful uh, businesswoman. How important is it to take time for the unobvious question when people are confused, right? I mean, it would have been easy for you just to walk away having done your job. You, you did your job. You handed pajamas to this little girl who needed them, but she didn't even know what to do with them. She didn't know what they were. 
I mean, I think that's a great metaphor for a lot of what happens in our lives, isn't it? Like we're here to help and we provide help and we think that they may understand it, but maybe they don't. Right, right. For so long, I think we let our heads and what's acceptable lead us step by step. So what if in the corporate world, something would lead me, lead my head to answer in an unemotional way. If there's a problem, find a way to deal with it, but don't get involved. Don't ask any emotional questions. And I think it's, it's very different now, thankfully, I believe, even in the business world, now a lot of our next steps are heart-centered. We're asking a question. We're looking for an answer in our heart. We're looking for an action that's heartfelt. It's heart-driven because it's the only way to connect. We've lost so much in that cold corporate world. We lost so much through COVID that I think we're it's like we're starving for connection but it's it's still difficult it doesn't come naturally for a lot of people and it's vulnerable you, you know it's very difficult not to feel something for somebody standing there who who tells you something that's breaking your heart or telling you something and you want to, to be sensitive and you want to ask that heartfelt question and it's hard to ignore your head that's telling you, don't get involved, don't ask, that's too personal. Just wish them well and walk away. I mean, we can't do that. We don't, we don't wanna do that anymore, thankfully. And I think it's, it's a, a curve here that we're, I think we're turning the corner to trust that all decisions that come from the heart, all questions that come from the heart will be received by that person's heart. I, th I find that fascinating. And I remember during COVID having a conversation with a lot of people. I mean, as we all did on Zoom and video conferences, and it became okay that when you ask the question, how are you? People would answer it honestly, all of a sudden, right? I mean, a, a switch went off and it used to be, how you doing? Okay. How you doing? Okay. And you move on with the conversation. It was a way of saying hello and it changed. Um, is, is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Because it, it's no longer a rote, a process of greeting somebody. It's one that involves some acknowledgement. I think it, it felt to a lot of us, including me, a near-death experience. And I think when we're that on the edge with our emotions inside, it it allows us to to take a chance because we're we're in need of connecting we're in need of telling someone i'm afraid this person passed away this person's very sick i don't know what to do i'm afraid it's 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 bubbling up in us it's it's coming out and i think maybe we thought what do i have to lose i i'm alone in the in the house. I'm alone with my very scary, frightened thoughts. I don't know what's happening with my work, my finances, my partner, my family. And I just, I think we were so hungry to, to say it, to see if there would be some kind of a response that would comfort us, that we started to take a chance and we found out we weren't alone. Yeah, that's, 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 that's powerful. Now, let's bring this back to this idea that the you said something early in our conversation about the growth was not all mine. So if we're not alone, right, I, I think as leaders, we can elicit the support so that growth is not all yours anymore. I mean, and we, we all these people who, uh, I, I think Schwarzenegger said it really interesting recently. He said, you know, the one thing I hate when people say it about me is that I was a self-made man. I'm not a self-made man. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm made of a lot of people, a lot of people, hundreds and thousands of people have helped me to be where I am today. And I'm nothing without any of them. And and I think you're saying a similar thing that your your the growth that the pajama program um in, enjoyed and you you've impacted a lot of lives for sure wasn't all yours, right? It it didn't oh. it, it maybe you were a guardian a part of it but not all of it. No, if it was just me, I'd be like Santa Claus with a sack of pajamas on my back and that's it. Um, no, I don't have a sleigh. 
but all those people had slaves. All those people who wanted to help because it was for it was for others. It was it was doing good for others who needed support. Nobody was getting rich by it. Nobody was benefiting. It was for the greater good. It it was making us feel better, which is what we what we all want to feel that we have a contribution to make and that we have meaning. When we wake up, we have meaning in our lives. We're we're helping someone, we're serving someone. And I think that was the part that was contagious. I think the idea of children, of course, has you know, has a lot of people interested in in helping. And whatever, whatever, if it's a nonprofit, if it's you play an instrument and you go to a concert, it's sharing joy. It's sharing some, it's, it's having integrity beyond personal gain. It's wanting, wanting to band together for something bigger that changes and impacts, that moves the world. And I prayed every night and so did a lot of people that we could keep doing it and, you know, and move these children a little closer to feeling loved because that's what it was. It had nothing to do really with the material of the pajamas. It was to let them know, and I believe they felt it, that someone saw them, that someone cared. It's, there were our, our arms around them and the sleeves of those pajamas and everybody felt it, no matter what part of pajama program you were contributing to. I think there was a really interesting moment and, and I watched your interview with Oprah and you talked about that little girl and you made this sort of almost, uh, it wasn't a flip remark, but it was a comment that you made very off the cuff. Something like, well, I remember my mother giving me pajamas and tucking me into bed and didn't everybody have that? And with pain in her eyes, she said, no. And and there is, there's a, there, there is, um, that is to the heart of what you were doing, right? You were, you're, you're touching people at a place which not only ends a day well with pajamas, but starts the next day, right? I mean, that's when you start your next day by yes. how you go to bed. And, and I think that's really impactful. I love what you said when you said serving and helping is contagious. Now, I, I know that, I know that the pajama program is, is a, is a, is a social, is a cause of social good, right? I, I get that. But is that something that you think this idea of serving and helping being contagious, is that something that we can apply in regular business too? And, and how? Yes. I think, I think it comes down to purpose. I think it comes down to sharing what you know your contribution is personally, because you can be a singer, you can be a, uh, pianist, you can be a veterinarian, that's sharing your purpose. That's connecting with people because it comes from love. You're serving people. And if you make a million dollars, good for you. You're doing it because it's it's in your heart. This is your contribution. This was a gift giving you. And we all have this gift and we just have to be brave enough to believe it and, and to discover it and then to give it breath because so many of us were taught to follow a career or to take a job. And so it's late in that career and job to make a change, you know, but I, I'm always a cheerleader for people who will do that because your life will never be more fulfilling. And it's because you will find others, your joy in whatever way you are serving people is going to be contagious. You will find others who will say, that's a beautiful thing. How can I help? Yeah, and, and and I think that you can use your career to make a difference too, right? I mean, you, it doesn't Absolutely. doesn't matter what you're doing, but you can use your career to make a difference. And I firmly believe in the notion that profit follows contribution. The bigger the contribution you make, uh, the greater the profit will eventually be in your life. So you made a couple big pivots around this need to make contribution part of your life, right? One from the corporate world into the pajama program how hard was it to make that leap as you as you move from you know wanting to climb that ladder and instead finding a different path what what did that look like scary um because i didn't share what i wanted to do 
and I tried to juggle, you know, and in my book, I have a chapter called leave juggling to the clowns because I made a mess because I didn't share. And I didn't let my heart lead for a very long time. My head was telling me how crazy I was. Didn't I remember I had a mortgage? What did I think I was giving these kids really? How many could I possibly reach? Am I just being, you know, a, a big mush about this one little girl? I mean, I really berated myself and scared myself silly. And it it wasn't until I was desperate to 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 get some help because the list of kids was growing. People were calling me. The the women and men who worked in the shelters were sharing my number, which I welcomed with their friends who were running shelters. So the the big the big phone that we carried as our cell phone was ringing off the hook in an office that we weren't allowed to have the cell phones. So I needed and and I realized by telling the first person, the second person, listen, I met this little girl. There are so many kids now. They were like, wow, what? What? Why didn't you tell us this? Yes. Okay. What do you need? Can we come? And I was, I was amazed. I was amazed at how it was received because when I tried to tell one friend who was also a corporate ladder climber, she told me I was crazy. And she said, why would you give up 12 years and, and the money you're making and everything? Can't you just do that on the weekend? You're really not changing lives, are you? And I, 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 was really thrown by that. So to take a chance because I was desperate to tell people and to receive that support and that enthusiasm. And then I met this wonderful man who turned out became my husband who said, I think you should go for it. I realized that that whole human connection thing is is my my, my saving grace. It's the key. It's the key for all of us. Interesting. It, it, it is it isn't an interesting um because it also sounds like a, a, this interesting equation, right? You had one person, you know, sort of feed your fears and and, and encourage you not to share one. And how many, it, 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 for all of us, I think it takes a lot of positive reinforcement to move ourselves forward and only one negative Nelly to crap on our parade. Um, has that gotten easier for you? Or is it still a challenge? Um, it's gotten easier. It's gotten easier because I know now that that's one person. And I know that it's in all of us to doubt ourselves. It's in all of us, the fear creeps in. And the more we keep doing it afraid, which I had to learn how to do, and that's advice I give people, sometimes you do it afraid, you will find those cheerleaders. And we have to be those cheerleaders too. So. It's gotten easier, but it exists. I mean, I still have doubts. We, I think most of us do. If if you don't, please tell me the secret. But I think I think it's it's easier the more you do it afraid, the more you risk your your feelings, the more you will let a tear fall when you're telling somebody what's going on and you see their reaction of comfort and support. You know, then you you breathe again. Yeah, and I think I, I like I like this idea of doing it afraid, uh, and I, I also like how you said that the, the sort of the antidote is sharing where you're at, being open about it, because I think that we no one will join us on the journey if we don't if they don't know where we are, and it's up to us to be able to share that, and 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 that's I think that's the vulnerability that you talked about that allowed the purpose to come forward, allowed people to align with you and, and, and allowed that growth to happen, right? You said the vulnerability allowed the growth to happen. Is that what you're talking about? Because that's when you got everybody coming forward with their slaves, right? When you were open about what you were, where you are, what scares you, and also, you know, what hope you have for it, right? Right, right. We have to inspire each other. And I think, to do that, we have to be an example of the good that can come out of putting your guard down, the good that can come out of taking a chance on your dream, the, the support that you'll get when you trust your heart voice, when it finally switches places with your head, which is a very real thing. Your head is telling you all the things that you can't, you can't do and why, and it's, it has legs. I mean, it, it's not lying. And your heart is fighting it and fighting it, but your head's winning. And one day, and nobody knows what that day is, but a day comes, it switches positions. And the head almost says, the brain almost says, well, okay, 
She's decided she's going to follow the heart. We're smart. We'll help now. And it takes that, that position. It helps your heart. And you're free. It's still scary. You still doubt yourself. But you, you have some inner guidance now that this is right, that this is will lead you to the right people. Never perfect. There are challenges. But you, you find this, this courage, this knowing that there are people who will be there and you'll be guided to them. Yeah. And, and you'll recognize them yes. because you're, you're, you're yourself moving into that environment with fewer filters, right? Yes. You're connecting your heart and your head. Uh, and that's where the magic occurs. Now you, you made another pivot, right? Uh, and that uh, you, you gave, birth to this pajama program movement you you started it uh, giving away i think you know tens if not hundreds of thousands of pajamas uh to children across america and then and then you you, you pivoted away from that again right i mean you, you 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 needed to leave that too why did you need to leave it well, over the 20 years that I was also executive director and and always still in shock that we are now 8 million pajamas, 40 chapters around the U.S. 8 million pajamas. Yeah, to kids around the U.S. and, and so many chapters, 40 some chapters. I realized, well, I didn't realize, I saw what was happening. People wanted to listen to their heart. A lot of people came to me, closed the door and said, I know I'm a bookkeeper. I really want to be this or that. You know, I use veterinarian because I was somebody who wanted to be a vet. How'd you do it? I'm afraid. And I realized that was a cherished, cherished position that I could share because I was sharing the downs as well. And I wanted to write my book because people appreciated knowing it's not all easy. Just, just go for it. Just jump because it wasn't that easy. But when you follow your heart, you do find ways that you could never imagine to get through the rough spots. You do find people that come out of the woodwork that appear out of thin air to take you to that step. And you just have to believe in yourself and believe that the universe is your partner and that you'll find the magic of the human connection. But there's work and there's all of that. But I found that people wanted to be inspired. So much happened after 20 years and through the 20 years of being executive director. And I wanted to share that because there were so many people who weren't taking a chance on themselves because they were afraid. So I wanted to share that. I wanted to speak and, and coach people and, and work with organizations, as it turns out, who want to align with each other, with the leaders, leaders who want to have a vision that's inspiring. You know, And I, and I tell them, you can be a voice that moves the world because you need to inspire people to have them see the good, the impact you can make together that is beyond a paycheck. And, and for you though, like inspire people, but inspire people from a place of vulnerability, from authenticity, from going closer to your to your heart, right? And I right. think that's- that They had an ally that, that yeah. I'm not going to tell them it was easy that I'm going to say, you know, I know, let me tell you a few things that, that scared me off the ledge. Mm-hmm. It, was, was it, I mean, okay, so you went from zero pajamas to 8 million pajamas in 20 years. That sounds um, incredible. Uh, let, let, it wasn't without challenges, right? I mean, I, I, tell me tell me about those times when you needed to learn, lean into your passion, lean into your heart and and do it afraid and survive against the odds like there must have been many what's the first one that comes to mind where it really saw you through the night um many many in the recession that was a really scary time in the beginning there are a lot of exciting times because you're growing you know you're growing um personally i had a lot because i'm not a saver so i spent more money had cards credit cards taken away from me you know was really in a bad place financially but that's that doesn't matter when when I'm we're talking about the bigger picture because when the recession came there there were more than just me worried 
and we weren't worried so much about ourselves. Of course, everyone was worried about their job and all of that, but we knew that what was getting us through was one woman, one staffer at one of the shelters said to us once, I'm so glad you come back. You know how many people say they're going to come back and they never do? That has stuck with me. And that, and I, and I repeated that often to our board and, and to those people because you need something to hold on to. You need that that brass ring to to grab onto needs to have a reason, needs to have a, a reminder. And a, a perfect example I'll give you of the human connection coming to the rescue during the recession is we were watching, as everyone was, people losing jobs, nonprofits folding, companies closing, people in, in trouble with their homes, everything. And I sat at the board meeting and I said, I have no idea. And I was very vulnerable because usually I had a million ideas. I said, I have no idea. I don't know what to do next. We need money. Everybody needs money. We can't let these kids down. I have no idea. And one of the board members said, let's go bowling. And I was, I was, I was concerned <laughs> because I thought, how come am I the only one doesn't get how that's going to help us? But I said, do, does anybody even bowl in New York City? I know people bowl in other parts of the country, but I don't understand how that's going to help us. And she said, does anybody else have an idea? Nobody did. And she said, let's go bowling. And I, uh, I said, okay, I was, I was at my wit's end. And we didn't make a million dollars, but you know what we did? We raised morale. People needed to be lifted up. We needed to change the energy. We needed to give people comfort and love and joy and fun and let everyone know we're in this together. And this is a reason to get out of ourselves and help. And it changed everything moving forward. It just was a beautiful love story of what one night of bowling in several different of our chapters did for the human spirit. It's, it's incredible um, what incredible. happens when as leaders, we, we uh, identify a challenge and wonder aloud to our team how we could possibly solve it together, isn't it? And that's- And by allowing someone to feel safe enough to say, let's go bowling and for and everyone to get behind it, including me, because I really thought, I, I have no clue where this is coming from. We're in New York City. I, I, nothing could be further from the truth than people want to go bowling. And but yet. Trust. And yet one of the biggest, biggest celebrations that we look back on as a stepping stone. Yeah. It's fascinating because it wasn't about the bowling. It was about the connection. It was another right. way to get connected to one another. Um, you said something that's remarkable and, and it sounds like it became a value, like a core value of the JAMA program. You know how many people say they're going to come back and never do. Um, that's powerful, right? I mean, I think a lot, I think, I think that's true everywhere. I'll, I'll call you next week. I'll do this. I, I will is a dangerous set of words infers a promise that a lot of people don't keep, isn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I do the same thing. I'm busy and I forget and I say it because I need it in the moment, but then life gets busy. But yeah, that was, that was, that went right to my heart. I could not, I could not not go back because, because of that. And, and these were, these were vulnerable children. I mean, to me, they deserved what I had, what we all, what I thought, like he said on Oprah, but we, I thought we all had. Yeah. That time. Um, that's incredible. I mean, there, 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 there's, there's so much more that I think is there, but I, I think the powerful things that are coming out for me is, is this commitment to serving and helping being contagious. And that and sometimes you have to do it afraid and you have to follow through on the things that you say you're going to do. Um, just, just any, any final thoughts that you want to leave with me? You know, take a chance on yourself, take a chance on that voice. You know, if it doesn't pipe up 
ask it to. Talk to yourself in a quiet moment. Feel your body when you're thinking about making a change or you ask yourself, what, what, what am I supposed to do? If I didn't do it at age 20, what was it that I can still do? And see what comes up and see how you feel. See how, how your body reacts. That's our, that's our, our thermometer. I love it. And let's go bowling. Um, <laughs> Jen, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on to Paper Napkin Wisdom. Thank you, Govan. Thank you so much.